Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmission Live. I'm Will Schick, and today I have the exciting pleasure of doing Hydra Bob. That's right. Today we're going to be painting Deadpool's cohort, companion, and all the time friend, uh, Hydra Bob, or more specifically, Bob, agent of Hydra. So let's hop off of this. Let's get on our Hydra Bob, and let's talk about how we're going to be handling painting this fantastic and amazing character a la two threat value. That's right. He is a two threat value character. There's your spoiler right off the way to go. So let's dive in and talk about how we're going to do this. So you were around the last Thanksgiving time in 2020. Uh, we did do a Hydra Bob on the channel. We painted him with his chef's hat because that is one of the options. So you'll see here's the completed Hydra Bob from that last stream. And he looks very dapper in his, there's a specific name for this hat. I don't actually remember what it is. Um, but today we have Sans Chef Hat version. We're going to go with the classic, the classic look. Uh, we're going to go ahead and I think today we're going to change up our color schemes from that green and the yellow, which is the classic Hydra colors. We're going to have a bit more sinister tone because this Hydra Bob here, I think, will pair well with my Cabal lists and my different evil affiliations, maybe my Criminal Syndicate. Uh, so with that in mind, we're going to do black and red, which are classic evil colors. Uh, and certainly kind of more of what you think of in the modern kind of MCU interpretation of Hydra. It's a lot more blacks and a bit more sinister red. So we're going to do that. The way I'm going to start this off is I'm going to throw on an undertone on the suit. So we're going to do the suit as black with the boots and everything else as red with a bit of the, the striping. So we should have a pretty good time here. Uh, and I'm going to kick things off by starting with an undertone. Like I mentioned, I'm going to be using my favorite blue black, which is abyssal blue from the scale line and i've mixed that with a bunch of water some glazed medium and i've just kind of diluted it out into this nice little wash consistency and all i'm going to do is i'm just going to start by undertoning our bob here who's been zenith primed like we like to do and this is just going to provide again a nice uh, color shade that will work really well when we move on to do our black wash which is how we'll get the suit to look really nice so by starting with the lighter colors first, we can progressively use a darker wash to shade in more of the recesses. We maintain that lighter color on top. I'm gonna add a little bit of liquid to this. It's a little thicker than I want it to be. And we can kind of build up this, it's effectively like reverse transparency. So what we're gonna wind up doing is, much like our Zenith Prime, we're just gonna build up our undertones and our highlights. And then as we take everything down, we're gonna see that undertone shine through our thinner and thinner washes that are gonna get darker. They're gonna tint everything back down away from this blue. And they're also gonna shade our recesses. So the more layers that we build up and the thinner they are, the more they're gonna pull into the recesses, which is gonna make those look darker. And it's gonna stretch out over the, the high spots on the miniature, all those areas on top. And we're gonna get a really nice effect overall that looks like we spent a lot of time blending and shading. But in factuality, we will have done pretty much nothing except applied really nice smooth layers of paint over and over again at various degrees of color. So this is a really great technique if you wanna get things to looking good on the tabletop, you get there really quick. It's also really fun because you can play with a lot of these different undertones, like you can completely change the value of your color and especially when working with blacks, it's all about that highlight. So you can have purple blacks, you can have green blacks, you can have brown blacks, you have gray blacks, blue blacks, like we're doing here. Uh, there's a lot of different places that you can you can kind of experiment and explore. I mean, you could probably even get away with like a red black or a pink black, depending on how careful you were with your washes. And all of that's going to change the feel of your fabric and your overall colors and your miniatures. And it's something you can really be quite effective with if you look, you know, if you want to go like a more old school kind of 90s comic vibe. These more blue than they did black. It was a very blue black centric kind of feel. So you can do that for your blue blacks. But if you want to go with like a more modern kind of era comic book black, you want to use purples or even grays. You can use those really stark like shiny vinyl blacks or the purple blacks that you see in a lot of the new Venom work and stuff like that. And so just by choosing your undertones properly and your highlight colors that you're gonna mix with that black, you can really dramatically shift the feel of the era, the feel of the character itself. And it can be a lot of fun to really play 
in those spaces and just explore and experiment because you're working with really thin layers of paint. If you don't happen to like the final tone or the colors, it's really easy to go back in and change as well because you're not gonna obscure any detail. Everything's really light, smooth and thin. Um, and again, we're not looking for perfect coverage here. We're kind of just looking for a nice overall transparency tone. And so we are cool with it being a little splotchy because we're gonna go over and cover that as we go. And in the end, I think this is pretty good. So all of that is just gonna add to those different layers. You can see that we have some recessed pooling right here where his leg is and all that good stuff. I'm gonna whip out my fancy dancy hair dryer because this stuff takes a while to Give it a quick little dry up so you can stare at black fabric. All right. So that said, I'm gonna do the rocket launcher really quick. Um, just to give that wash a little bit of an extra time to dry. So we'll lay down a base coat. We're gonna start with one of my favorites, black metal from the scale 75 range. It's a really solid dark steel. Uh, makes a super good base depending on what you wanna do. We want this gigantic rocket launcher to look nice and scary. So a really nice, deep, dark metallic. It's gonna play well with the rest of the outfit and give us kind of that sinister weapon appearance. So this is just gonna be a really smooth base coat. You notice that I'm not bothering with uh, re-undercoating or base coating the metal in black. It's because overall I find that these colors cover really well. And because we're gonna be doing some washes, some dry brushing and some other detailing, I'm not super concerned with the fact that the lack of opaqueness on the paint is gonna allow it to be a little brighter than it normally would. If you did this color over a black base, you're gonna get something a lot darker. If you wanted to just simply do your metallics through dry brushing, which is a really fantastic way to get great looking true metallic metals, you would absolutely have to base coat this weapon and anything else that you were gonna do in that color in black, but since I am not going to be dry brushing this, I can get away with just skipping that step and just going straight to my metal base coat because I know this metallic is gonna cover perfectly well over the gray. And then anything that I wanna tone down, I can do with inks and all that good stuff later. One of the fun things when developing Bob was the uh, polite, I'm gonna use polite in quotation marks conversations that we had over the size of his rocket launcher. And uh, originally he had what I like to call a toothpick on his shoulder. It was an accurately scaled, according to Marco and Dallas, um, rocket launcher for Bob's human size and everything. And I was just like, look, this is the biggest feature of this character is this weapon that he lugs around everywhere and makes things spicy with. It better be huge because it is his whole focal point. And uh, so we kind of went back and forth and I was just like, look, just blow it up, make it bigger, just make it bigger for me. And so we sat, I sat over Marco's shoulder and he like kind of used his little uh, Z brush magic and he stretched it out and made it a little bigger. And I was like, bigger. And he's like, seriously? And I was like, bigger. And we went to a point where I was finally happy with it. I was like, okay, now print that out. And it wasn't until later when we were building the final plastics that Marco was just like, you were right. You were right about the rocket launcher this one time bigger was better. And I was like, of course it was. It's fantastic. So obviously we want to make sure that we pay all good, good attention and love to that, that rocket launcher. That Bob makes it, makes it spicy with. So uh, it was really, Bob was a, much like Deadpool, you know, you get, you get zany, you get a little crazy. Um, we had, we had a lot of fun just kind of exploring um, what we wanted to do with Senior Bob and how we wanted him to act on the on the battlefield and what was his point. It can fire tacos, I'm sure. I mean, he's got the hot sauce underneath his foot. So I'm gonna move on to the black for the suit. I'm gonna use some black wash. I'm gonna mix that in with some just straight flat black. And I'm also gonna use a little bit of one of my favorite uh, colors. If I can find it here, I'm going to use some Vallejo black glaze, which is going to give a bit of tooth to my overall black. 
And I'm just going to mix all this stuff together. We're going to create a little black wash, something that's going to give us some high contrast and hopefully stretch really nicely over everything. I'm also going to mix a little bit of that abyssal blue in with it because I want it to tie in and be a little less on the pure black side. So we're just kind of like messing around completely with everything going on here. And we're just going to start washing this boy down and getting to a point where we have a really nice, cool looking black outfit. Again, when it comes to mixing your blacks or your washes, excuse me, not your blacks, mixing your blacks too, I mean, mixing anything, there's no perfect, uh, there's no perfect ratio. It's kind of just whatever feels right. It's a bit like seasoning when it comes to cooking. Every paint's going to require a different amount of liquid versus paint versus everything else. Where did I put that? Black glaze. I think I, oh, there it is. Um, so just don't be afraid to experiment and test things out either on your thumb or on your palette. It's all important to check out. So we're just gonna, again, take this wash and we're gonna put it all over um, Mr. Bob. I tested my wash. I want it to be just a little thicker, just a little bit. So I'm gonna add a little bit more pure black paint to it. So it's a little thin right now. And I don't think that it's gonna give me exactly what I want. That feels a little better. All right, so here we go. So we're just gonna go back in. So yeah, so Bob was, he was a fun kind of interesting question. All of the two threat characters honestly are um, equally an interesting puzzle because it's a, the two threat value is such a unique spot in the game where, you know, when you're a three threat, character you typically can have some utility you know a couple of options you may not do everything just one way some characters do like you get your valkyries and your more straightforward three pointers who just do one thing do it really well your crossbones so wants to go punch things um, and has the durability maybe to get across the table and do it but your two pointers your two your two threat characters you know the, you can't have you really have to pick a defined a very defined role like what are they going to do what's kind of their battlefield shtick, and then you have to really focus in on it because you don't want you don't want characters that suddenly can um, become more efficient for a less cost, and then you're also getting more activations out of cheaper characters. You're getting more characters on the table that obviously by itself can help with winning the crises because you're going to be able to secure more, extract more, all of that stuff. You can play the numbers game a little bit. And every time your opponent is attacking your Hydra Bob with his Thor or with her Angela, things like that, you're kind of winning as well because it's a disproportionate response to maybe the value of the character. And so we always kind of have to start really soul searching with these two pointers and say, okay, what is, what is our primary goal with this character? Like what is, what is the role that we want them to play? How are they going to focus on the table? What are they going to do that's kind of interesting, unique? And it makes them a fun design and development challenge because you really have to identify the root of what that character wants to do and then come up with clever ways to kind of apply it. With Bob, you know, we knew that we kind of wanted to lean into that Deadpool humor. Bob is perhaps the... I would say the absolute lowest totem, like lowest on the totem pole of any superhero in terms of skills or ability. He is just a named grunt, but because he has a name and he's friends with Hydra or he's friends with Deadpool, he gains a lot of that like typical superhero suite of abilities. So he, uh, he has this tendency to always avoid serious injury. And, you know, you might say that he put all of his skill points in luck with the way that things turn out for him. And so we really started kind of uh, messing around with that idea and how do you play that in? And then, of course, I think Dallas came up with the idea that, oh, let's just give him a giant rocket launcher. And then all of a sudden, you know, my thought after we had concept of the rocket launcher was, well, if he's going to have this gigantic rocket launcher, 
that should just be his shtick. His shtick is is that he's this walking one shot arsenal, where he has this super impressive like over the top weapon that he only really gets to use once, and then once he does, he's kind of useless for the rest of the game. And that's where we started. So we started with the idea of okay, well, what does that look like? So excessive violence, which is the name of his spender attack. Uh, his big, his big super attack is, uh, it, it's quite the potent, it's quite the potent, um, it's quite the potent attack at zero cost and nine, nine strength. Um, of course it has a lot of drawbacks to it as well. Uh, specifically when he fires it, he, he dazes or KOs himself. Um, so he gets thrown short by your opponent, so he can go flying into your friends if you don't position him properly, or he can get knocked off the point. Um, it's it's definitely hilarity. It's It's got that classic 90s wargaming hilarity that ensues, so you get the super big effect, but it also comes um, not without cost. And then, of course, the other big thing is that even when Bob stands up, um, he has to load the weapon. He's got to make it spicy, so there's a whole... Uh, there's a whole rules based and and superpower based around him being able to reload the gun, and that of course can be very difficult for him to do, which kind of mitigates the effectiveness of it and makes it kind of this one game thing. So he uh, he is absolutely a hoot to play. I imagine that some people will love playing Hydra Bob, and many people who are just looking for pure efficiencies and um, reliability may may not. They may not believe that bob is the one for them but um he was he was an absolute right i'm excited for everyone to see his card and to kind of get the full like nonsense of his abilities uh, because we really we had a blast working on him and and i just i'm really thrilled with how he turned out he kind of hits all the boxes that I think we really wanted out of Deadpool and, and the character that came with him and, and honestly just the Bob of the comics and the way that he has kind of become part of the Deadpool mythos in this really silly and yet spectacular way over the last several years. Um, I also really appreciate his backstory. I mean, the fact that... Bob only became a Hydra agent because his wife demanded he get a job and he needed one with health benefits. And so he just wound up going to Hydra because they had they had what he thought were great benefits. But then it turned out that Hydra doesn't offer dental. And so he's always regretted his decision to join Hydra over AIM because AIM has a much better dental plan. Um, just the things, you know, the the weird, difficult choices that you have to make in life and, and the way that things work out. It's so relatable in this like crazy, silly way. All right, so let's start working while that while that black dries. We're gonna work on the red. So I'm gonna start with some mayhem red. This is just a nice deep color that we can start with and make our straps while our black dries a little bit. So this is going to take a couple of coats likely to cover in a way that we want, not a big deal. And of course we're going to play around that wash because we're not quite dry on the blacks, but that's okay. If we get a little bit of wet blending going on, um, it's really not going to be a huge issue. Yeah, we're going with that more comic booky, like bright colors. So the red is going to be pretty rich, and we'll wash that down with some crimson wash, maybe with a little bit of purple and some crimson ink tents from Scale. And that'll bring us back down into that sinister range. Look a little less like he's wearing go-go boots, but in a way he's wearing go-go boots. So let's be honest. That's just it's standard fare when it comes to Hydra. You know, that's that's how life goes. Hope everybody had a chance to check out the streams last week. We showed off, uh, I did a Deadpool on stream. Dallas did a taco truck. Man, it feels like last week was so long away. Um, Dallas's taco truck is insane. 
you just look into the into the window where the tacos come from and you see true art. That's that's all I have to say about that. Just absolutely true, beautiful art. It is wonderful. So I hope everybody's been having had a great weekend. For those of you who watched uh, the big sports ball game that happened on Sunday it was it was a time. It was enjoyable. One of those weird, not truly a holiday, but definitely treated like a holiday in the States thing, the Super Bowl. We had a lot of fun here in the house. We made snacks and watched the cool commercials and and watched, you know, something resembling a football game happen. It was it was it was all right. There are worse ways to spend a weekend. I also Man, I got a lot of hobbying done over the weekend. It was great. Finished off a of Deadpool. Got to work on some other MCP stuff. Work on some other minis. Like, it was rocking. It was a great weekend for me as far as the hobbying go. I hope everyone else had the same amount of success. So, again, we're just kind of going through. And um, I have assumed that all of the pouches will just be red like everything else because... That's what I want them to be. You could do them brown. I'm pretty sure Brendan, who painted the Amazing Studio miniature, he's got the straps being the color yellow. And then he did like the holster and the little like ammo pouches and stuff. Those are all, I believe, a brown leather. There's a lot of different ways you can go on this guy. You kind of see as that, as that ink is drying, how we have this really great multi-tone black and we did that with just one kind of application now if we want to intensify that we can easily go back through as it dries and do another pass of the black and this is one of the really fun things about working with washes is that you can really control the intensity of that color so the more you push the more layers you put on the more intense or ink tense if you're you know using some scale colors that color is going to be a little bit excited with my red on that pouch. So I'm just going to fix that really quick. I'm going to go back to my black. I'm just going to dot in a little bit of that dark ink. There we go. No one's going to see that, but I did. So I'm going to fix it. Come back to my mayhem red. Finish out the straps. Get his little hero marker. I don't know. If, if you're not aware of, you know, Bob's story, um, that little H on his chest right there that I'm painting, whoop, right, right here, that little H used to stand for Hydra, but now it stands for hero. Yeah, that's right. Inspiration right there. Bob giving it to you. He's giving you the inspiration. Don't let, don't let the labels people apply to you mean what they think they mean. You let those labels that people that are, that are on you apply to you in any way you feel is fit. And when it comes to Bob, he's a true hero. That man has sacrificed a lot to keep the world safe alongside the one, the only Wade Wilson. The lone wolf whose hunger can only be satisfied with one, one meal, justice. Now this Bob, on the other hand, like maybe maybe this is Bob before the H became hero, you know? And then I've got green chef hat Bob, who's who's now living his best life in the taco truck. It's part of Deadpool's Tex-Mex empire. Maybe that's, maybe that's the narrative. We have two different versions of Bob. Maybe this Bob went undercover, you know? He was working, he was working the Tex-Mex taco truck and then realized was was called forth to duty once more to rise up and protect the world once once again alongside Wade Wilson as an undercover agent. Oh, could the H be for habanero? Well, I mean when he makes it spicy, it's it's definitely it's definitely habanero style. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. So I am all for H being for habanero. Because it is super spicy when Bob gets involved. Super spicy. All right. I'm just going to go in. So I'm going to take the same wash that I had before. 
I'm going to mix in a bit more water with it just to thin it down more. So this is exactly what I had. I just made it a lot thinner. So I can kind of show you on my thumbnail here. So this is the original wash. So you can see it's, it's already pretty thin. Um, but it definitely, definitely has some pretty good coverage. And this is kind of what I'm playing with with that new thinner wash that I really just want to get into those recesses because I want it to really stretch over. So you can see the immense difference in terms of how that paint is much more translucent. It's much more of a transparency up here. Whereas down here, I was getting a lot of that, that dark color. So this is kind of what I talk about when I say, you know, we talk about mix, mix the colors and loosen them in the way that kind of works. There's no perfect recipe for this. I'm just kind of playing with it on my palette. I'm seeing where I'm getting that, that right transparency. This is going to pool a lot more and it's going to tint the top. But what I really wanted to do is run into those crevices. And because it's so it away from raised areas if I need to. So like on this thigh and stuff, I can go back in with a little bit of a wet brush and I can blend that color away from where I want those highlights to really shine. And so this gives me a lot of control over stuff. And the other thing to remember too, when you're working with really thinned out paints like this, they're gonna look a lot stronger when you apply them than they are when they're gonna dry because there's a lot of water in there. So as these things dry, they're gonna kind of change in terms of their saturation and their tones. So, you know, don't be, don't be too worried about when you apply it. If you keep them really thin, and again, we know it's really thin because we saw how it looked on my thumbnail, and I knew how it looked like because I was testing on my palette before that, um, it's gonna dry much, much different because of the amount of liquid in it and the way that water is gonna dry out and there's a wetness and a shine to it and all that stuff. So you, you know, don't freak out. That's kind of this, the rule of don't freak out, let it dry. You're going to notice that things are going to adjust and change. And that's exactly what they should be doing. And if, as it's drying, you know, you're not, you're not feeling the effect, you can go back in with a wet brush and you know, pull away some of that color. You want to be careful. You only have a limited amount of time to do that. So when it gets, starts to get tacky, don't try to mess with it. Because if you do, you're actually going to pull up all of the paint on top and you're going to get the paint below it. So just be aware of kind of where the, the, the wet factor is, like where in the drying process your paint is when you're doing stuff like this. Um, because it is going to make a big difference if you're going a little too early, and that's where a hair dryer, like having the hair dryer close by, can be a big boon because you can speed up your dry times, you can see what's going on, and then you can go back in and affect it later. And if we want to, we can always go back in and do some more traditional, um, some more traditional like highlighting, and we can pop things back out with a little bit of line work. And so there's a lot of ways to affect it if we get a little too carried away, but. The great thing about painting is it's all about working within your mistakes and turning those mistakes into meaningful choices. So like I've got black over my red. I'm just going to kind of wet blend those together. That's going to give me some nice natural shading just to start with. And then I can go back in and play with it later. Being careful around those boot edges because I didn't get them the first time. You notice I'm using a size two brush right now, um, which just has a really good point on it. This is one of my newbies. I opened it last week. It's been a really great workhorse for me so far. And yeah, as long as I keep that point nice, it's gonna be able to do pretty much everything I need it to do outside of some really fine detail work. Or if I just wanna like sneak into smaller areas brush control will help. So smaller brushes aren't always necessary to get really fine detail work done. Um, a good point, a nice belly so you have a decent amount of paint to pull from and it doesn't dry out on you super fast. It's well more important than that. All right, so there we go. We're moving 
moving right along, moving right along. I'm gonna grab some of this black here just because this, this white gun barrel is really bothering me. It just looks off, so we'll fix that right now. It's normally a step that I would just save until the very end, but off-putting, off-putting. There we go. All right, let's grab. Um, let's grab a little bit of our skin tone. So I'm just going to grab some basic flesh and a little bit of Ishtar pink. So here's our Ishtar pink. And oh, you know what? I grabbed golden skin. Let's just use golden skin. Why not? So I'm just going to mix these together. Um, you can make your own flesh tones really, really easily. There's no wrong way to do it. It's just white, yellow, and black for the most part. And then you can add in blues and greens and purples and all kinds of colors. Um, but you know, at its very core, skin tones are really just yellow, black, and white mixed together in varying amounts. So. And you know, the awesome part about Bob and most superheroes is that there's very little skin to paint. So if you're like me and it's not your favorite thing to do, you really get away really well with uh, this stuff. Just look around, make sure that we're getting all the chin. Go. And this is where I get my head in the shot, maybe. Just trying to make sure that I'm getting everything all right there. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, feeling pretty good about this guy. Feeling pretty good about this guy. We're rocking and rolling right along. I'm going to, I think we're going to give the eyes a bit of a, a colored metallic look here. Now, see if Josh was around, if he was if he was hanging out in the chat, he'd be like, look at this cool daredevil color scheme that we've got going on right now. And I'd be like, you're right, Josh. This could definitely work for the man without fear. Um, for those asking about brushes, so what I use is I use Winsor Newton Series 7s um, as my workhorse brushes. Uh, they're really, really nice. Um, they've got that Kalinske sable, so they're natural hair bristle, bristles. Um, they are definitely more widely accessible these days, thanks to the proliferation of the hobby and, you know, a lot of art shops carry them and a lot of online retailers have them and stuff. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the brush is going to help, but it's your control with the brush and your familiarity with the brush that's going to make the biggest amount of difference. So if you're just starting out, you know, you just want a brush that has a really nice point and has a big belly. So you can see how this comes to a really nice point. So that gives me a lot of control in terms of paint application. I can get really fine detail. And then the belly's right here. So this is how much paint it can hold. So the bigger the belly and the more paint it holds, the longer working time you're going to have with the paint because the paint's going to dry a lot less. So one of the problems that you get into is a lot of people like to, you know, they get like the tiniest of brushes, like this one here which I love this brush. I use this size zero all the time for stuff, but you have to be aware that it can't hold a lot of paint. So your paint's gonna dry out. So people try to do eyes with like triple zero brushes because they're like, well, the smaller the brush, the more control I have. That's true to a point. You can't make as much mistakes, but your paint's gonna dry out so fast from palette to, to miniature. So having that fatter belly so that the paint has a lot more working time is super important. Um, so primarily the, the numbers that I use, uh, are the two is kind of the one I use for just about everything. If I'm working on something bigger, you can use a three. Um, and then I really like, so I usually switch back and forth between the two and the zero. That's just the style that works best for me. Um, Dallas really likes using a three and a two. And then every once in a while he goes to a smaller brush. Um, again, as long as it has a really nice point on it, you can kind of use whatever. 
but I would I would definitely um, I definitely recommend you know look for look for that fine point look for that big belly it's gonna make everything like work really nice I'm gonna go in and we're just gonna we're gonna go crazy on the reds normally I would do these buckles in like gold or something but I'm liking this red metallic this garnet alchemy from scale so we're gonna give the buckles all red metallic and give us a little button we're gonna make his button metallic yeah his H is for hero I'm gonna make that shiny and metallic uh, and then of course you know the other thing to consider since we're talking about brushes is you don't want to use your really nice uh, natural bristle brushes when you're doing things like stippling unless it's like an old an old past its prime brush one that you've retired um, but synthetic brushes work really great for things like dry brushing, stippling. You know, you can get good base colors with a with a synthetic too. There are people who really like synthetic. So find what makes you feel comfortable and what works well. Um, I don't think that you can go wrong. You know, with the with the Windsor Newtons and Series Sevens, they offer a lot of benefits, and I've been using them forever. But that's also a comfort level thing. Uh, end of the day, find the tool that works best for you and. Learn how to use it, and you're going to be just as effective as anybody. And, you know, I say it all the time. You can buy the most expensive master craftsman tools possible, but until you learn how to use it, you know, it only goes so far. A brush isn't going to instantly improve your painting. It might make learning techniques and doing things easier. So by no means, don't get me wrong there. Having the right tool can be a huge boon but it's not gonna instantly improve your painting. That's only gonna come with time, patience, and practice. Um, yeah. I recently upgraded my airbrushing state, station and, and took the plunge and got a more professional grade airbrush after using kind of the intermediate levels. And I'll tell you what, it, I could tell the difference. Like I wouldn't tell you it didn't change my life, but I also had spent a lot of time learning how to use the tool if I was just coming in fresh. I certainly don't think I would be as aware of how good and and how much more efficient things were going on because I just wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what I was looking for and what to do. So allow yourself the opportunity to practice and learn and, and you know, level up as you go. There's a reason they don't start you and, you know, they don't start you on on the super the super big rocket launcher. You got to earn that, like Bob. You know, he's 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 put in his dues. He learned how to use the smaller hydro weapons before this. I did just say the H is for Hero Gamers Guild because that's what it stands for. It used to be for Hydra. You missed our whole diatribe on Bob and why he's a great character. The H used to be for Hydra, but now it stands for Hero. That's our Bob. A true hero. All right. Well, I have that, and just to... That's not the right one. It's this one. So just to be clear, that red metallic that we're using is Garnet Alchemy again. I'm going to mix in a little bit of the speed metal to it, just to create a little bit of a highlight. While I've got it wet on my palette. I'm just going to go back in and do a little bit of like dotting. This is going to make quite the pink. It's going to be wonderful. It's very Valentine's-y. But it's going to feel, it's going to give us that right amount of reflective spotlighting. And I'm just kind of working this towards the, towards the bottom of our italics. And I'm going to come in get really quiet because I need to find my I'm lost and I need directions so I'm turning down the radio and then I'm going to grab some of that pure speed metal. I'll do just a little 
little light reflective dots just to give that pure reflection. That's where the sun is. Look at it glinting, glinting off of our famed hero Bob. I got a little heavy there, so I'll just blend it out with my brush. Those eyeballs, a little bit of a glint. Just make them look really nice. I'm gonna grab some flash wash from, oh, this is just pre-made flash wash from Vallejo. I'm gonna hit the flesh really quick. We got 20 minutes left, we're cooking. We got this. Yeah, so if you haven't checked out the uh, Facebook, and just saw the chat was asking about this earlier, uh, BK pulled off the spoiler shades from the mystery reveals he posted up, I think, last week or earlier this week. No, it must have been last week, uh, which is Sin and Viper. Super thrilled um, for those two to come out. They were a lot of fun to work on as well. Definitely characters that have not gotten a lot of spotlight outside of the comics but very important characters to the comics and a lot of the animated shows actually. Uh, Viper was a huge player in my favorite of the animated series for the Avengers, which was Earth's Mightiest. Uh, she played a really nice big role in that show and um, is definitely a character that I'm excited to get to add to my Cabal rosters and my affiliations of evil. And then Sin was a super awesome opportunity to go in and um, expand the leadership options for Hydra, or for the Cabal. Not Hydra. She is from Hydra, but she's working with her daddy now on, on his new venture, his, his, new, his new thing for MCP, his revised and revamped Cabal. Well, Madam Hydra is very smart drive. Viper and Madam Hydra are definitely different stages in that character's development. So, like we've talked about before, um, we very much view these characters as kind of hopefully, uh, you know, snapshots in time and certain in certain elements of their story arc and what they're trying to do. And uh, Viper, to me, you know, uh, this is kind of like. She's still working her way up to the aspirations of Madame Hydra. So this is kind of more her, you know, being Viper is more of her lieutenant days where she's certainly no slouch. She's she's leading people, but um, she is she's not quite ready to take on the mantle, the leadership aspirations of Madame Hydra. That comes later. And it's the same thing those asking about Sin and her alternate head. Um, you know, again, from kind of our vantage point, when Sin takes on the full mantle of her her daddy and uh, those who are familiar with my absolute favorite comic arc of all time, Fear Itself, will be aware of... Uh, Sin's kind of cosmetic change that she goes through at one point um, and becomes more like uh, more like father daughter. That is, that is definitely a different kind of stance for or a different kind of state of being for her, and one that I would love to explore someday. But this is this is not quite. This is this is definitely not that version. So, you know, sometimes sometimes we do decide to try to cover different bases, or it makes sense for the character. But a lot of times, when that when that base is, um, you know, does it step on the toes of another version of that character that would be really compelling and fun to do in the future? And these are 
often the considerations we make when we look at stuff like that. Um, so with these two characters specifically, I think, you know, the hope is, is that we will have that opportunity to go back and revisit and explore kind of their progression throughout the comics as uh, fantastic and amazing characters. All right, so I'm really, I'm really digging where we're going with this more sinister version of, of Senior Bob. Um, I'm going to use, I think I'm actually just going to use my black mix that we used on. Um, I'm going to grab that same black wash because it's still wet on my palette. I'm going to add a little bit of blue ink tents to it. And then I'm going to use this as my mix for my rocket launcher with which he will do excessive violence. So we're just going to wash this down. And again, this was kind of what I was talking about at the start as to why I didn't feel the need to undercoat the rocket launcher in black because I knew I was going to come back in with a really dark wash and kind of shade this puppy down. So this is what we're going to do here. And that blue is going to add just the right amount of tint that's going to give it that kind of dark alloy gun steel feel to it. Make sure I stay on camera though as I manipulate the miniature around just to make sure I'm hitting all these areas. So this is just slap it on, you know, like a classic wash. Just hit it nice and neat. And see how it's already pooling in all those recesses and stuff. I'm gonna get inside that hand, cheat a little bit. All right. Let's go ahead and shade the red. Uh, so I'm going to grab some crimson ink tents, which is right here. Oop. I'm going to grab a little bit of violet ink tents. I'm going to mix in just the smallest drop of violet ink tents into that crimson. And I'm looking to kind of create a Red, purple, so I can show you right here, kind of like what we got going on. So you can see it's kind of like a deep magenta, but that blue's in there playing really nice. And this is gonna help shade our red. Uh, shading reds with blues is choice. It is fantastic. You can never go wrong with it. In fact, you can shade pretty much any color with blue and it works out really great. We're just gonna slather this on to make our wash. Get a nice shading in, and then we can go back in and highlight up if we need to. But because we're just looking to get a really solid table ready bob using our washing and stuff will hopefully mean that we don't have to go back in and do that extra step. But we can. What's going on? And then remember, this week is our first week of four streams a week. So if you're interested in hanging out, doing some hobbying on Wednesday and Friday in a bit of a different galaxy, you're more than welcome to come join us. It's going to be 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I will be back again tomorrow to have some fun and hang out, do some more hobbying and painting and just chew the fat and then john schaefer our new uh well new to amg but definitely um an extraordinary vet of asthma day in general um is going to be on fridays it's a fantastic hobbyist has been painting miniatures for a long long time he's gonna be hanging out on fridays at 1 p.m and showing off tips and tri tricks and techniques and stuff like that. And then of course you got Dallas Kemp, the one and only who's hanging out in chat right now. He's gonna be doing his normal stream on Thursday and I believe that he's gonna be painting a requested pink pool.
just in time for Valentine's Day. Um, so we got we got all the hobby and content you could want. Just come hang out, chat. Hopefully, maybe get inspired, learn a thing or two, ask questions. We're happy to answer whatever we can and talk about things and the manner that makes the most sense. Uh, Dallas and John are both incredible resources when it comes to hobby questions. I do my best to try to keep up with both of their prolific miss. Um, but you know, we, we just have a good time. We just want to be here for everyone out there in case you are still in one of those places that's in lockdown or not able to get to your local store. You know, our hope is that this kind of provides that outlet to check in on each other. I love seeing how everyone in the chat is always checking in and seeing how things are going and how everyone's doing. It's so awesome. Get a little emotional. We'll talk about how amazing it is to be part of these communities and why they're so important. And at the end of the day, that community is what really makes us at Atomic Mass Games want to get up and go to our home offices at the moment. Um, just you know, continue to hopefully kick ass and make better and cooler things in these incredible worlds that have all meant so much to us and impact people throughout the globe. We just want to give everyone a chance to put their mark on it in a fun way through these incredible miniatures and these awesome games. And you know, It's been a blast. Excited to continue on and continue to do things throughout the year as we keep going. With that in mind, I think that we got ourselves a pretty well done Hydra Bob. So I'm pretty, pretty thrilled with this boy, especially as far as the tabletop ready and an hour standpoint goes. So we got our blacks, we got our reds, they're all shaded down. If we really wanted to, once that red ink is dry, we could go back through and kind of add some highlighting to it. Um, do a little dry brush on the rocket launcher if we wanted to. And of course we still have to hit the box. So let's see if we can take care of that like right now. And we're just gonna mix up a really quick Mix of, uh, yeah, this will work. We'll use some brown leather here. Some scale, we'll use a little bit of brown ink. Use a little bit of that black wash that we mixed up that's been so useful throughout the entire show. And all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a really quick, oh, well, we'll have some red, it's okay. It'll be painterly. We've been a little smoother on that. We wouldn't have had to worry about the red, but hey, the hot sauce spilled. It's all over the box. It's fine. We'll just call this our undertone here. Just to say that we painted ourselves a box on the stream. Nothing too fancy. We almost we don't usually finish the bases on this stream, although I think we're probably due for another basing episode at some point because we did one of those, kind of talked about different ways to approach the bases. It might be time to make uh, to make Dallas Kemp pull out all of his modeling experience when it comes to bases and get some modeled bases. I noticed that the community was asking some questions about what defines a modeled base and uh, people clearly getting ready to go to some organized play events and stuff. So we can we can maybe tap some ideas on how to really turn the bases into something special as well. Oh, see, Dallas, I'm not even looking at the chat. I'm just thinking the same way. All right, well, there we go. We'll call that good enough for the for the box as it dries. And a little hot sauce spillage, we'll play that into something good. Um, but otherwise, I think we're looking pretty good. So I'm going to call this Hydra Bob a success. He's ready for the tabletop. He's ready to hang out with the Cabal and maybe the Criminal Syndicate. Blow some things up. It's an amazing way. I will share one card with you guys just for funsies because BK has requested that I continue to kind of show some things off in the interim. So I'll show you one of my other favorite cards if I can find it here. I wasn't prepared for this. So, you know, stick with me. I think you can hold out. We got some time left. Where'd we go here? It is right here. I think somebody was talking about how important are those tacos that come on the frame. 
and uh, again, you know, they can be pretty. They can be pretty important. So this is yet another one of the cards. Let me zoom out just a little bit here. That comes in the box. You see our chimichangas, our Deadpool, Harding his his chimichanga love here. So what does this what does this tactic card do? Well, uh, it it turns into a whole mini game here. So Deadpool may spend one power to play this card. Add a chimichanga objective token asset to the game. Deadpool is holding this token. At the end of a character's activation, if it's holding a chimichanga token, it gains one power and may remove one damage or one special condition. Any character may use the following interact ability: interact chimichanga, pick up the chimichanga as the actual battle rages around. Uh, this is all in part to, I believe, Dallas and Pagani. This is their brainchild. Um, when we were talking about fun things to do with Deadpool and ways to kind of like make uh, Deadpool just feel a little bit more like Deadpool in the comics, uh, especially some of the more modern interpretations where he's got that silly vibe to him. This card came out of it. It's been a lot of fun. It's certainly one of those risk reward things. You throw it on Deadpool, he immediately starts gaining benefits, but if Deadpool gets knocked down or your opponent maybe has a way to venom blast it out of your hands or things like that, it can wind up being bad news bears. Um, and somebody can start stealing your chimichanga and you start playing a game of, you know, take the delicious Tex-Mex food. So there you go. That is chimichangas. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's work. Remember, I'm going to pull this off of our Hydra Bob. Looking pretty dope and dapper. So do remember that we are back on hashtag painting protocol challenges. This month it is royalty. So show us your royalty, whatever that means to you, whether that's in human royal family, uh, purples, golds, yellows, all kinds of different colors can fit into this. Uh, we're really looking forward to resuming our Instagram challenges where our staff gets to go through all of your awesome paint jobs, pick out some that we feature on the stream and then also put on our Instagram page as well. Uh, just to celebrate the hobby and the work that everyone's doing out there. We love seeing your work. We can't wait to see more of it. So again, hashtag painting protocol. You got a, like a week and a half left, one week left. I don't even know what time of the month it is anymore. Um, but that will end on February. We'll make our picks and we will show off the winners uh, of the staff pick uh, selection process uh, in March. So be sure to check that out. Also, I have a bit of bad news for you all. I know everyone's really excited to get their Deadpool, and we were saying that he was going to be coming out in March. Unfortunately, it looks like there might be some delays. So there'll be more information on that release coming forward, but he may be pushed back with his cohort, Bob, uh, by a little bit due to some global uh, shenanigans. So be sure to watch all of our social media for stuff looking forward. We're going to be as transparent as possible to make sure that you all have the most up-to-date information on everything to expect. Until then, we're going to continue to hobby. We're going to continue to have fun. We're looking forward to hanging out with you all more. Also, remember, if you missed last Wednesday's stream, we are doing something really awesome for March. We are looking at having a virtual constravaganza, as I like to call it, for Atomic Mass Games. Uh, it's, if you joined us for Gen Con, virtual Gen Con last year, we're trying to do the exact same thing, just doing it ourselves. So it's going to be a lot of uh, fun hanging out, a lot of different streams on hobby, on rules, all that good stuff. We're really looking forward to doing that and hanging out with you. We're going to be taking three days uh, in March at some point, that's going to, there's going to be more announcements and kind of information coming forward as we move forward and figure out kind of our finalized plan. Um, but we're just going to have a blast. Again, we just want to celebrate with you all, be with you as much as possible over this digital space and just have a good time and continue to support and promote the communities that we all love and bring us together in fun and exciting ways. Uh, with that, thank you so much for joining me. Look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow, Wednesday, 1 PM, check out Dallas at 1 PM Pacific on Thursday. And then of course, join John our latest and greatest new streamer on Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific. We've got a ton of great content for you. We're here. We're ready to hang out. So let's do it. Grab those brushes, get those paints, hit that hashtag painting protocol challenge, and we will see you on the next one. Goodbye.